folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Roto channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a special emphasis on that most wonderful genre, steampunk. Today I'm going to be talking about one of the founders of, of the steampunk genre, one of the, one of the early writers that started in the 1980s and 90s, James P. Blaylock. Uh, and there were two others that I, I will talk about in other videos. Before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about my own projects. Uh, there was there I have done with along with Mrs. Desperado. I've done a couple of books available on Amazon about a young American heroine back in the Victorian times called Professor Ion D. There's two books out there. I will leave put links in the description below, and I'm soon going to start on a third. Now that I've finished the military sci-fi, I've been working on it for a while. I'm going to be working on a third, which will be called Professor Ion D and the Steam-Powered Minotaur, which takes place in Greece and Turkey. And I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun. And I'll let me know. I'll let you know about my progress. So, back to our regularly scheduled program. James P. Blaylock was a. Uh, he's an American. He's an American sci-fi writer. He was a protege of the great Philip K. Dick, who wrote, among other things, The Man in the High Castle and some other very imaginative uh, books. His, his stories were the inspiration for things like Blade Runner and um, Total Recall. And so, a very great man to have uh, consulted with. The other guys were Cato Jeter, who, uh, founded the, who coined the term steampunk because of the popularity of cyberpunk at the time. And... Uh, Tim Powers, who wrote the great novel Anubis Gates. A little, a little quote from uh, Blaylock here. Uh, literarily speaking, steampunk refers to contemporarily written stories and novels that are set during the Victorian era. I would expand it a little bit to say stories that have a Victorian feel, stories that sound, that read like those kind of uh, novels and stories from that era, and that have take place in similar societies with like steam power and um, com comparable mores to the Victorians of, the, of Britain or Gilded Age America, which is what they called it over here on this side of the pond. Uh, as I said again, he was one of the pioneers of steampunk and, and an American who seems to know Britain very well. And the other two guys, uh, Jeter and Powers, were also Americans. They all lived in California at the time. Uh, two of them, I believe, were born there, including Blaylock, and uh, the third was from Buffalo, New York, but ended up in California, and uh, which is where Philip K. Dick lived until his uh, his untimely demise. And what I like about Blaylock's books is that uh, they're great adventures; they're almost melodramatic. They have a bizarre inventions and occurrences. And they have a clear demarcation between good and evil with dashing heroes and terrible, awful, vile villains. And it, his, his writing style is a lot like, it's reminiscent of H.G. Wells combined with Charles Dickens because uh, of all the seamy underbelly of uh, society stuff. And P.J. Wodehouse, the very dry uh, humor of that, of that writer. So these all... Three of these books that I'm going to talk about, because he's written many books and a lot of fantasy and a lot of steampunk, but um, these three books are known as part of the uh, Landon St. Ives series, which is based on the name of one of the protagonists, well, the primary protagonist, let's say. And uh, in the first book, he's was one of several, and, and then they go on to kind of focus on him. He is an inventor and a explorer and general all good guy. <laughs> Uh, flawed as everybody is, but he's he's a, generally a a upstanding citizen and a family man, that kind of thing. And so he's a member of the Trismegistus Club, which is the which is the um, focus of the first book, Homunculus, uh, written in 1986, and received the uh, Philip K. Dick Award in 1988. Second book in the series. Uh, Focusing more on St. Ives, Lord Kelvin's Machine from 1992, published by Arkham House. And third, uh, a little bit later, 2013, 
uh, during the uh, steampunk boom in the 21st century called the Aylesford Skull. I've read all three of these. There's a fourth one that's called Beneath London, published in 2015, which I have not really read yet. But I, I didn't want to delay this. I, th I want to, really want to talk about some of these, some of these great uh, figures in steampunk. And I will be continuing these in future videos. So, some of the other heroes, some of the other characters uh, in Homunculus, which is, you know, like a, a human-like character. In this case, it's a little man in a box. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, uh, there's other characters from the club, including um, uh, St. Ives' valet, Hasbro, who is very reminiscent of Jeeves from uh, Woodhouse, very clever, uh, very clever gentleman's gentleman. Uh, Keeble, who makes, uh, creates astounding clockwork toys. Uh, Bill Kraken, who is kind of a, of a down on his luck, a bit of a drunkard, but he's uh, basically good-hearted, and he ends up helping these guys and kind of becoming a member of the club. Uh, Jack Owlsby, who is just a regular guy who is engaged to uh, Keeble's daughter, and Theophilus Goddell, who is a character from a Robert, Robert Louis Stevenson book called The New Arabian Nights. And he kind of lifted this character, which you can do if it's, if it's public domain. Uh, so, as I may have said before, his books are kind of a blend of, of uh, the uh, adventure and the uh, scientific extravaganza of H.G. Wells, uh, the uh, seeming underbelly of society, the pathos of uh, Charles Dickens, and the dry humor of P.G. Wodehouse. And uh, he's, he, Blaylock's also written some shared characters with Tim Powers, by the way. And uh, including this imaginary poet named William Ashbless. <laughs> In contrast to K.W. Jeter, I find Blaylock's works to be a little bit more optimistic, a little bit more positive. Uh, Jeter's works are pretty, are pretty pessimistic, very dark. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. The villains, in uh, speaking of dark, the villains in uh, Blaylock's works are pretty evil. Some of them. Now you have your your just annoying people like Dr. Parsons of the Royal Society. Uh, they don't like, I mean, though St. Ives is an inventor, they, he does, they don't consider him one of them. He's not good enough to be a member of the Royal Society with the other scientists. He's, uh, which, is, which is cool. I mean, that goes back to 1660, a very amazing organization that has a lot of great history behind it. But anyway, they're kind of snobs in this book, and so that's why there's the Trismegistus Club because they're kind of the rejects. And so he's kind of annoying. There's other characters, like there was an evangelist who's kind of conning people. There was a... Uh, people who were running all these brothels and doing human tra trafficking. But the most evil of all was Ignatio Narambanda, who's as repulsive in appearance as he is in his soul. He is a uh, deformed, hunchback dwarf. And uh, the first book is the... The homunculus is the most crazy. It's got a very complicated plot, including a mysterious airship with a long dead pilot that's just circling around the Earth. How it does that, I think it has something to do with this alien artifact that everybody's looking for. The second book involves time travel, which Mrs. Desperado doesn't care for those kind of books, but uh, anyway, it, St. Ives, his fiance Alice, is murdered by the evil Armando, and he has to go back in time to try to save her. And that's why it's, it's Lord Kelvin's machine. And, and this machine was eventually, originally meant to move the Earth, literally, out of the way of this comet. And, uh, but St. Ives realizes this is probably going to be worse than the comet. And so he steals the machine and uses it for time travel. And he also wants to make Nirvana a better person by preventing the disease that made him into a deformed hunchback. And uh, it's, it's interesting. And he's at least partially successful in that, but in the third book, Narbondo is back as a hunchback and just as evil as ever, so I'm not quite sure how that works. You know, although the science in his books are, is always very far-fetched, it all seems plausible in the, in the context. You can, you can suspend your disbelief and have a good, have, have a good time with it. Uh, there are these great mysteries. There's mysteries involved, and it kind of veers toward the supernatural, but it doesn't really depend upon it. It could all be a fake. The third book, the third book, The Aylesford Skull, Narbano is more evil than ever. He is murdering people, 
taking their skulls and making them into artifacts that supposedly contain their ghost. And he'll like project them onto the linen fog, scaring people. Uh, and he wants to use this to open a door to the other side, the great beyond, the world beyond death, that kind of thing. So you don't know if he's just insane or if he's really going to do this, which makes it makes it all the more interesting. But it also, he's kidnapped uh, St. Ives' five-year-old son, so we have a great amount of urgency here and a lot of reversals as they try to, try to rescue him, and Arbondo is always one step ahead of them. So, and it was still a great book. So one of the things I really love about Blaylock's book is the language, the, the British vernacular, the very, the, the, all the uh, fun expressions, you know, Bob's your uncle, that kind of thing. And I love his great knowledge of English places and customs. And a lot of that came from a book called uh, London Labor and the London, Peep, and the London Poor, which is a book of Victorian journalism by Henry Mayhew from the mid-1800s. And he knew a lot about how the very poor got along. And some of this is, is captured in Blaylock's books. It was pretty, pretty interesting. There was people who lived in the sewers called Toshers who collected junk and resold it. There was also people that combed the banks of the Thames, that mucky mud. And uh, they were called mudlarks. And uh, although they were they were in miserable poverty, you gotta say the recycling <laughs> it's very environmental. Uh, so, so that there's a lot of authenticity because of that. The biggest drawbacks are the books can be kind of complicated, especially the first with a lot of characters. It can be sometimes hard to you know, a little confusing and to see what's what. There's a bit of discontinuity between book two and three because you think he's maybe fixed Narbondo uh, from his evil, and, and but Narbondo's back and just as evil as ever in book three. There's a lot of other works by Blaylock, um, some others involving St. Ives in these characters. There's a lot of fantasy works as well, and yeah, pretty interesting. And we'll be talking about other steampunk greats in future videos. Please give me your comments in the uh, space below. Uh, please like and subscribe. That helps us get out the good steampunk word. As far as um, ratings, I'd give the trilogy probably about 4.5 gears out of 5 for its great adventure and so on. A little, over, a little bit over complexity, especially in the time travel. But I highly recommend it to somebody who wants to get, get um, acquainted with the world of steampunk. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.